Hello YouTube and welcome to the 5th PTG Rail Train Guide video. Train guides are documentary style videos where we focus on one particular locomotive or unit in each episode. We take a look at both the history and technical specifications of each train before taking a look at the cab and considering any pertinent driving techniques. On today's episode, we will be looking at one of my personal favourite locomotives, which is the Armstrong Powerhouse Class 90. The fleet of 50 Class 90 electric locomotives was built by British Rail Engineering Limited at Crew Works between 1987 and 1990 under contract to GEC. The Class 90s were developed from the Class 87, and during construction they were classified as the Class 87 Stroke 2. However, due to a number of technical changes and a number of visual differences, they were later reclassified as the Class 90, with fleets numbering being from 90001 to 90050. The fleet was developed as a fleet of mixed traffic locomotives, being used on passenger, freight and parcel services. After their introduction, the Class 90s rostered for passenger duty were primarily used on the West Coast Main Line between London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool and Glasgow. With a maximum speed of 110 miles per hour, they were well suited to this run as this was also the maximum speed limit on the route at the time. 26 of the fleets were dedicated for freight traffic in the early 1990s and were reclassified as Class 90 Stroke 1 locomotives. This reflected the 75 mile per hour maximum permitted speed along with the isolation of the electric train supply. These were numbered as 9125 through to 9150. At the time, Many of these freight locomotives were repainted into rail freight grey livery. When British Rail was privatised in 1996, the Class 90s were distributed to a number of train operating companies, with Virgin Trains West Coast inheriting a fleet of 15 locomotives for passenger services along the route. The first Class 90 to receive the new Virgin Trains livery was 90002, which was named Mission Impossible. From 2002, with the gradual introduction of the Class 390 Pendolino trains, Virgin Trains started to phase out its loco hall fleet. Initially phasing out Class 86s, by 2004 they had also phased out Class 90 services, with the fleet being transferred to the then new One Anglia franchise, operating the Great Eastern Mainline. Here they replaced Class 86s which had previously been running on intercity services between Norwich and London Liverpool Street. Today, this fleet is operated by Abellio Greater Anglia. Other train operating companies to operate the Class 90 after privatisation include EWS which is now DB Cargo UK and Freightliner. EWS acquired 25 of the Class 90s with Freightliner inheriting a fleet of 10. A number of DB Class 90s were repainted into First Scots Rail livery in 2006 to operate exclusively on the Caledonian sleeper services from London through to Scotland. Today, this role is being taken over by the Class 92. In 2007, a Class 390 Pendolino derailed at Grey Rig in Cumbria on the West Coast mainline as a result of faulty points. Because of this accident, Virgin had the need for extra rolling stock. Hiring out Class 90s from DB Schenker and then more recently Freightliner, they refurbished a set of Mark III coaches and repainted the set in a livery which is not that dissimilar to that of the Pendolino, thus earning it the nickname Pretendolino. Class 90s were also used for a short time on the East Coast Main Line, with EWS providing the locomotives to stand in for Class 91s on GNER services. One of these locomotives was actually repainted into GNER livery. 
The Class 9 T4 train simulator is available in three different packs, with the original pack and the Freightliner pack being available from the Armstrong Powerhouse website, and the Great Eastern version being available on Steam. The original pack comes with the most liveries, with a total of 18 different liveries. These liveries include DB, DBS, EWS, First Scott Rail, Freightliner Grey, GNER, Intercity Swallow and Intercity Mainline, One Light Blue and One Dark Blue, Parcels Red, Several Rail Freight Distribution Liveries, SNCB livery, one of three special liveries which were created to celebrate the Freight Connection event in 1992. SNCF, which is another of the three special commemorative liveries. And also Virgin Trains, both branded and unbranded. The Class 90 pack on Steam features two different unbranded National Express East Anglia liveries. The Freightliner Class 90 pack includes two liveries, which is Freightliner and Freightliner Powerhaul. The Class 90 locomotives are 61 feet 6 inches in length, 13 feet in height with the pantograph up, and 9 feet wide. With a wheel diameter of almost 3 feet 10 inches, they have a minimum curve radius of 80 meters, which is 4 chains. The total weight of the locomotive is 84.5 tonnes. Powered by overhead wires running at 25 kV AC, the locomotive is fitted with four traction motors rated at 1,250 horsepower each, giving a total power output of 5,000 horsepower or 3.72 megawatts. This gives a maximum tractive effort of 58,000 pounds of force, or 258 kilonewtons. The maximum speed for the locos is either 75 or 110 miles per hour, depending on the subclass. They are fitted with both rheostatic and air braking systems, with a locomotive brake force of 40 tons. They are also fitted with a TDM, which is a time division multiplexer. This enables two or more locomotives to work in multiple, as well as allowing use with a Mark III DVT on push-pull services. The Mark III DVT comes with the original Class 90 pack, as well as the pack which is available on Steam. DVT stands for Driving Van Trailer, and it allows a driver to operate the locomotive from the opposite end of the train. It's an unpowered vehicle with a driver's cab, and it enables push-pull operation. As you will see in a moment, the cab of the DVT is slightly different from that of the locomotives. Now that we've had a look at the history and background information about the Class 90s, let's take a look around the cab and go through the startup procedure, which is slightly different from other trains. The Class 90 has been modelled to a high level of accuracy, which makes for a much more realistic startup and driving experience. Here we are in the cab of a Class 90 at Palmady Depot in Glasgow on the West Coast Main Line. I've chosen this particular scenario as the locomotive is currently in a cold and dark state, so it means I've got to go through the full detailed cold start procedure to set up the locomotive before departing away from Palmody Depot. So what I'm going to do here is I'm first of all going to go through all of the steps of the cold start procedure, and then after that we're going to have a look around the cab and talk about the various controls and any technical information pertinent to those controls. And then after that we'll just drive a short way towards Glasgow Central just to demonstrate demonstrate moving the train and operating the braking system before concluding the video. I've now moved to the driver's side of the cab ready for the startup procedure, and so the first thing that you need to do when setting up the locomotive from a cold and dark state is to switch the BIS or battery isolation switch off by pressing CTRL and B. As you do that, you'll then see the LED lights on the bottom of the dashboard there have now all illuminated, and the driver reminder appliance light has also illuminated. 
The next thing I'm going to do here now is operate the parking brake, which you can just see the parking brake there on the left hand side. If I now press shift and forward slash, then that presses the off button in, and you have to then hold that down until the indicator there says off, which you can see it now says so. And then as you can see on the notice below the indicator, you then got to hold in the off button for a further 15 seconds after the indicator shows the off position. This is just to ensure that the parking brake is fully released. So I think 15 seconds should have passed around now. The next thing that we need to do here now is press Ctrl and Z to put the master key in. So I'm just going to do that now. And then now that I've done that, we need to raise the pantograph so that the locomotive is connected to the overhead wires and can draw power from them. There's two ways to raise the pantograph. The first is that you can click on the pan up reset button, which you can see on the top right of the eight buttons in front of us there. Or you can just press and hold the P key, which is what I'm going to do now. And then as I do that in a moment, you will now see that the line light LED here, which was red a moment ago, is now showing a yellow light, which indicates that we do now have power coming through the pantograph from the overhead wires. Now that I've done that, I'm going to move the reversing handle into the neutral position by pressing the W key twice. And now I've reset the AWS self-test sequence as well, which happens at that point. When I move the uh, reversing handle into the forward position ready for departure from Palmody, then I will also have to reset the driver safety device by pressing the E key. The next thing I'm going to do is turn on the marker lights, which are the two outer headlights on the outside of the locomotive. There's two ways to do that. You can either click the switch here, which is what I usually do, or you can also press the J key. Um, also, while I'm over here with these lights, or should I say with these switches on this side, going to flip the instrument light switch just to turn them on so the instruments are easier to see. Now I'm going to put the headlights on by pressing the H key. And we also have a headlight indicator LED which you can see here. If you wanted the night time headlight setting, then you would press Shift and H instead of just pressing H. Now I can see the signal in front of us here is clear, so the next thing I'm going to do now is just um, turn off the driver reminder appliance by clicking on it. You can also press F on the keyboard to turn off the driver reminder appliance. I do now need to turn on the electrical train supply so that the passenger carriages have a supply of electricity for the lighting. Next I'm going to jump to the rear cab now which is the DVT cab at the opposite end of the train and at this point I'm just going to flip the tail light switch to turn on the red tail lights. With the class 90 in train simulator the tail lights do not come on automatically when you turn on the headlights in the locomotive and so you have to go to the other end of the train to manually uh, switch the tail lights on. This is also the case when you're driving from the DVT end and the locomotive is at the rear of your train, you would still need to go to the locomotive at the rear to turn the tail lights on. Let's now go back to the front cab of the uh, train, so the front cab of the Class 90 locomotive, just to go through some of the controls and the technical information about the various systems which have been simulated. The first system that I would like to talk about with the Class 90 here is the braking system. So you can see just in front of us here there are two levers there which both control the braking system and you can also see that there are three brake gauges towards the top right of the screen. So the first braking system we have here is the locomotive brake which controls the air brakes only on the locomotive. To apply the brakes it's actually a spring loaded brake handle so if I press the apply button now and hold it down and then let go it then moves back into the neutral or hold position. However, it's not spring-loaded on the release position, so if I now want to release the locomotive brake, I move it to the release position and then the handle will stay there until I've manually moved it back to the centre position once again. Now in front of us here we have the train brake handle which has six steps of braking. So if I now move the handle all of the way to the release position there and then let go the handle spring loads into the run position. And then we've got the initial brake application and then up to six steps of braking before the brakes are in the emergency position. 
Now, the train brake controls the brakes on both the locomotive and the whole train. But with the locomotive, when you're doing between 110 and 30 miles per hour and you apply the brakes, the air braking will not activate on the locomotive if you use the train brake handle. Instead, the locomotive will use solely rheostatic braking, which uses the traction motors to slow the train down. It will continue to apply the air brakes on the rest of the train, however, so you will still notice a slight change in the brake cylinder pressure gauges which are here in the cab. If we just look up there, you can see the brake cylinder pressure gauges there, and so the higher the needles are pointing, then the harder the brakes are applied. The brakes are now in the emergency position, so you can see there they're pointing between four and a half and five, and also the air brake pipe gauge, which you can see on the right-hand side, has dropped to zero. So I'm just going to move the brake handle back slightly now. So as I said, from 110 to 30 miles per hour, the air brakes will activate on the whole train except the locomotive, which will use rheostatic braking. But as rheostatic braking relies on the train moving for it to be able to work, it cannot bring uh, any train to a complete stop. And so what happens is, as we get below 30 miles per hour, then the um, rheostatic braking will start to lose its effect, and and the air brakes on the locomotive will begin to increase to counter the loss of brake force from the rheostatic braking. And at that point, you will then see the uh, brake cylinder pressure need needles slowly climbing to indicate that the air brakes on the locomotive are now increasing due to the decrease in rheostatic braking. In front of us here on the right hand side is the speedometer measured in miles per hour and indeed you can see a red line there by the 110 indicating the maximum permitted speed of this locomotive of 110 miles per hour. Just to the left of the speedometer there we've got the speed set control which I'm now reducing with the comma key down to 10 miles per hour. So on the keyboard to operate the speed set you press the comma to reduce it and you press the full stop to increase it. What the speed set does is it prevents the train from going above the speed at which you've set it, in this case 10 miles per hour. And also, in addition to that, if you've got the throttle on slightly, then it will also uh, prevent the um, train from gaining speed, even on a downhill section, because it allows the locomotive to use the rheostatic braking system to control your speed. In front of us now from right to left, firstly we have the horn control, which is a two-tone horn controlled with the spacebar and the B key. Just to the left of that, we have the AWS reset button, which is controlled with the Q key. And then just to the left of that, just here, we have the throttle control. Now, the throttle on the Class 90 locomotive is a smooth throttle, so you can just make gradual increments and gradual changes to the power settings to try and maintain your desired speed, and also have a great smooth acceleration when starting away from stations. Just up here we have the ammeters in front of us now, and as you can see we, there is a green, a yellow and a red zone. The ammeter measures the currents, and the higher those needles are pointing, then the more the currents. And what you need to do is try and keep the needles out of the yellow and red zone, and generally only keep them in the green zone to prevent an overload. In front of us here is the train preparation sheet, and this is to do with the possibility of encountering faults or errors with the Class 90 within Train Simulator. There is a small chance that you will encounter a failure, however the chance is indeed very small, as in all the time I've had the Class 90, I've not yet actually experienced any faults or failures. You can turn off your chance of experiencing a fault by pressing Ctrl and F on the keyboard. There are three possible fa faults which you may experience in the Class 90. The first is a traction motor failure, which will appear written on this sheet in front of us. And what this will do is it will cause lower rates of acceleration and also decreased rheostatic braking performance. In addition to this, you will also notice that one of the ammeters will only give a zero reading, which indicates that you do have indeed a faulty traction motor. As a result of this, you will need to adjust your driving technique to take into account the slower acceleration and braking performance of your train.
The next failure which you could encounter is a speed set control failure. This fault will appear written again on the train preparation sheet in front of us here, and as a result of this you won't be able to use the speed set to control your speed, and instead you will have to control the speed manually using the throttle and the brakes. The final error which you could encounter is the ADD or auto dropping device fault. The pantograph at this point will drop and the ADD alarm will sound with both the auto drop and line light um, LEDs here in front of us, both showing red which indicates that the fault has happened. To rectify this situation you need to bring the train to a stop as soon as possible and then cancel the alarm by pressing this red button here, the ADD alarm reset and then once you've done that you need to press the pan up button once again until the line light LED has gone back from red to showing a yellow light and then you know that you've managed to deal with the situation. Now that we've had a look around the cab of the locomotive, we're just going to take a quick look in the cab of the DVT just to point out a couple of very minor differences in cab layout and then we'll pull away from Palmody and just drive a short way down towards Glasgow. In the cab of the DVT, the first thing that you can really notice is just how much smaller the windows are when compared to the cab of the locomotive. But other than that, the layout of the cab is very much the same, with the same buttons and uh, switches on the left-hand side there, the brake handle still being in the same place, and the brake gauges. The first new thing in the cab here is the traction and brake um, lights, which you can see just in the middle of the screen now at the top. And so if you were, say, braking, for example, then as the rheostatic braking works on the locomotive, then the traction brake light there will illuminate yellow, which indicates that the uh, rheostatic braking system is in fact working. The other key difference in the cab of the DVT versus the locomotive is that you do not have an ammeter here, so you've got to drive slightly more carefully to prevent overloading the locomotive, as you can't actually see um, the number of amps which are going through the locomotive from this end of the train. Now let's go back to the front of the train and depart towards Glasgow. Now at the front of the train I'm going to put the reversing handle into the forward position and now reset the driver's safety device with the E key. And at this point now release the brakes and just gradually start the train moving. I would just like to point out that if you're using the Great Eastern Mainline Class 90 pack which is available on Steam, then the driver safety device is not controlled with the E key but instead with the numpad enter key. And again, the speed set on the Great Eastern Class 90 is not controlled with the full stop and comma keys, but is instead controlled with the Y and C keys. As you can see here, I've just put the ammeter into the middle of the green zone to gradually accelerate. We certainly don't need to accelerate too quickly, departing from a depot, and especially when the maximum speed limit along here is only 10 miles per hour. As this isn't a route learning video, I'm just going to take some slight liberties in a moment. And so as we get out of here, then I'm not going to wait for the rear of the train to have passed the new speed change. I'm just going to start accelerating away straight away, just so that we can get moving a bit quicker. And I can demonstrate the braking system. So just as we've crossed this point in a moment, I think the speed limit is going up to something like 25 to 40 miles per hour. I'm just going to increase the speed set up towards that anyway. So I'm just going to pull the power back for a moment. That's just to make sure that I don't overload the locomotive or give the passengers too much of a jolt where I have to have passengers on the train and gradually start accelerating. And now at this point you can see the ammeter needles are climbing quite nicely, but I still can't go into full power quite yet because then the needles will go into the yellow zone. So I've moved them as far into the green zone as I can for now, and then in a moment I will increase the power further. So we're just on the edge of the green zone now, and we're actually able to hit full power or 100% throttle once we're doing between 30 and 35 miles per hour. So I've now just gone up to full power at this point. The needles went just into the yellow zone, but now they're falling off once again. 
At this point we're now doing the 40 mile per hour speed limit. And in a moment the speed limit, as I mentioned, will be dropping to 30 miles per hour. I'm just idling the power now, and I'm just going to demonstrate the braking system here. So as I start applying the brakes, you can now see that the needles on the ammeter have started climbing, which indicates that the rheostatic braking is working. You can see that the air brake pipe gauge there, has uh, the needle has fallen, which indicates that the brakes are on, on the rest of the train. But the brake cylinder pressure gauges there have only just started climbing now we're getting towards 20 miles per hour and this just indicates how the air brakes are gradually replacing the rheostatic braking as i slow this train down now if i release the brakes then you'll see both the ammeter and the brake cylinder pressure gauge needles there have both fallen and so now i'm just going to increase the speed slightly just but pull the speed set back to 30 miles per hour to prevent breaking the speed limit here so now we've had a look around the cab of the Class 90 and we've considered the various systems on board. I think that pretty much brings us to the conclusion of this video. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for watching this video. I really do hope that you have enjoyed it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also please don't forget that you can find me on Facebook for the latest updates. The link to my Facebook page being in the description of this video. Once again, thank you for watching.